OK. Then you're ready. So we have three papers today to go through. And uh, I hope and think you have all been reading all the papers so we can make this more interactive. Because what happens is that when I read it, I read it by my background and what I find interesting, which means, which is obviously not the complete story. There's more to these papers than what I've highlighted. So if you have uh, other things that you would like to emphasize and you would like to throw in and you have read it a little differently, then we can have more of a dialogue and discussion than me just going through my view of the papers. The first one is uh, written by Kurt Squire, and it's a rather large paper, many pages. But I think that when you read it, you find that it was still quite easy to read because lots of the paper were details about how to set it up and, and details of the results and the discussion. So it's not very technical. It's not very hard. So I, I think it's still OK, even though there were many pages. But it was horribly informal. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and the reason is uh, if you go to the next uh, slide, uh, I want we'll, to we'll talk about this limit um, of reality, and we'll go into the game uh, that they designed and the case study that they designed, the results and implications, which are the most important things. But as you will see, for on all these papers, I also have at the very end some reflections on the papers. So this is kind of a meta discussion, discussion on the paper and the design and what I think about the paper, not so much about what's really in there. So if you go to the next, um, so this paper. Um, you will find a more updated version, I think, of it in the teacher college records. I think that you need to have a subscription to read it there. So what we do have is the in-press version, the one he submitted. So that's, uh, so that's uh, what you find on his, um, on his uh, website. But if you go to the uh, teacher college records, if you have a subscription and get there, then you can get the nicely formatted one. So this is typically the, uh, the one that you will be submitted. Um, and what the paper is... Uh, is about is a case study that explores the nature of learning within game-based environments, which already tells us that this is a kind of a explorative paper in which they try new technology and observes what happens. And that's also the, uh, the reason why it's quite verbose and doesn't get much uh, words. But they're trying to, to look at what are the implications, because the reason for doing this is to learn something, is, is to see what are the implications. Uh, and in this case, specifically the role of information technology in a digital era. Augmented reality, you all know what augmented reality is? You all heard the terms? So augmented reality is about mixing typically images or bigger feeds from the real world with digital objects that you can superimpose. So here, for instance, assuming that you're buying a house, take a camera and point to the house, the system is recognizing the house and says it's a sale, so you can show you the, the price of the house and look at the prospects, and here you can get into a chat with the seller as you are there on site. So that's kind of the open ground. So this is the type of technology that they will uh, want to see if that could add, if it changes um, learning and if it can add value to a learning seller. So, what we should look at is what is the problem they're trying to address? What are the research questions they, are, they have uh, posted? And how do they want to answer this? So the problem is, is really this. The current school is very much print-based. So it's about information, giving the students information and some skills in, in processing that information. Uh, while the school, well, the kids, when they come to school, they have, of course, these mobile phones with all kinds of interactive games and applications. And it's not so much about, I mean, and information is there, easily available. So it's not so much about going to school to get more information. It's, um, they, they are want to be more interactive, more explorative, learn new things. And so there's a kind of a gap here between what the kids meet at school and what they uh, are used to, uh, at home. I don't know if you uh, looked through some of these videos that we uh, put on the web or the front page that you could read uh, or, or look at, and there we'll see that the, the, some of them address this issue that especially boys are having problems in the classroom because they are used to move around, be active, and then they have to sit down and just 
digest information, which is not their mode of operation in many cases. So that is the problem, trying to say, OK, can we use AR games? And can uh, augmented reality games work in a school context, meaning as part of a subject, of a topic being taught at school? So it's not just something that they do to find going to school interesting, but to actually learn stuff. And then the question is, what are the curricular experiences that are effective in supporting such a gameplay? And what teaching activities are effective? So these are the uh, research questions that the um, Squire and his group had in mind when they designed the study. <clears throat> and the methodology that they use is what they call a design-based methodology, which is quite often used in these kind of explorative uh, projects. Uh, so it's basically, let's make a game and then hand it over to the teachers and see what happens. <laughs> That's basically the, the model. Now, these, I, I think this is a very good paper. I'll come back to that in the reflection at the very end. Because in many cases, the developers skip the second uh, step here. So they develop something, and they themselves rush into schools and try to introduce and see how what happens, which then is obviously is a, a risk of having a biased uh, setup. In this case, they develop it. They give it to the ones who are teaching, and then they observe from the outside. Um, and the data sources, because since this is research, they need to have data to analyze and to draw conclusions from. So the data sources that they have here will be then the observations of students and teachers. So they sit in and look at what's happening in the classrooms, what happens in this field trip they have. Um, they interview teachers to understand what they want to accomplish and, and how they design their own teaching and their, uh, how, what they felt was, was uh, useful or not so useful. And in the end, they also analyze documents, documents produced by the teachers, their plans, their notes, uh, everything the teachers have been producing, and of course, then the students, what, what has been the production of. The school that they used for the study um, was in Milwaukee, uh, and they had 12 year old students, 55. Now, there was, uh, they had all the same subject. But they were divided into groups. So there were uh, seven different classrooms, seven different groups uh, of students uh, going through the same. This was in the school year 2006 and 2007. And there were two teachers involved. There were actually two teachers who did uh, run the game. And it was one science teacher and one language arts teacher. So the paper doesn't, at least I'm not able to read uh, from the paper exactly what the learning outcome in the topics, only the subjects where I'm assuming that it has to do with science and it has to do with language, reading and writing language uh, or English reports. Game, they called it a sick at South Beach. So it's a science mystery game. The, uh, there is a group of kids who have been out uh, by the shore and they come back and they are ill, infected by uh, E. coli. And then the mystery game is the students are to investigate what could be the cause. And there are two main alternatives. One is the goose droppings. There are lots of birds out there in the harbor and in the, uh, the beach. But there is also farms nearby. So there's lots of rain. The, the storm water will run off the fields into the lake. And you might have the E. coli there from, from the farms. And the students then get lots of data that they need to process and assess and evaluate to try to figure out which is the more likely cause, what to kind of find a kind of a, a chain of arguments and, and proofs that would show which is the one. The students, the, the, the game is set up like a role play, and the students are given roles to, um, to play and, and to have a specific competency in the group. So uh, there are water chemists to be able to analyze the, the water samples, the quality of the water. There are public health doctors and wildlife ecologists. 
These are the experts, field experts, and they all need to read and understand the case from their perspective and need to be able to discuss and present the case to the other students in the group because the game is designed such that to get a correct answer, you really need to take all the input from all these professions into account. So if one is dominating, they won't come up to the best uh, possible conclusion. So there is also a, it's not just, uh, I think that's that's one of the, uh, the um, aspects of the game here is that it's not just learning science and language, but it's also learning a way of working, learning, uh, as we'll see later on as well, well, strengths and weaknesses in your own uh, skill set. Um, so one day they are out there in the field, and this is where the AR comes into play. They are in the field, meaning they are at the shore, and they can start looking at the samples, familiarize themselves with how it looks like, and, and the water quality, and, and uh, all this uh, data that they need. Um, and uh, we can look at it on the next slide. But then um, the, the game was designed by these researchers who know game and AR technologies, but also teachers. Because this is an important thing for educational games, is that the game is there to improve on the learning of the subject matter. So you need experts on the teaching, as well as the gaming experts. This is the uh, augmented reality interface. So here you can see the view of the river. This is the, the harbor. Um, this is the medical doctor role. So each one has a PDA with that interface. You can see what is his role. So he is a, uh, is a doctor. And this is where he's currently located. You see that on the, on the map. It's, I'm, I'm not sure if I read it correctly, but I'm understanding that they are ne not necessarily there at the shore. I, I'm not so sure, but uh, because it's an, they say in, in field trip in, uh, in uh, boats. So, but anyway, I mean, the, the, uh, they are using positions. So the, um, the, there's a GPS on the, on the PDA, so they know where they are, and they can move about in this virtual scene. But it's, it's uh, real pictures, but then they have some data samples they can go and pick up and visit here. And uh, there are some virtual characters in the scene. Uh, this is the time, virtually, in which they were at the scene. And, and here are some of the documents and, and data that they uh, have gathered. And, and of course, so that is kind of the, uh, the interface. This is how they get their field trip. And this is how they get the data that they are later then to go back and analyze. Um, I'm skipping quite a lot of the details on, um, on the discussion of what they observe. And I, I think that when you read the paper, you might have found that interesting to see a little bit of the students' feedback and the teachers' feedback. And it's quite, uh, before going into individually, this individually, it's quite obvious that the uh, students were, were motivated and engaged into this process. Uh, the question is whether they were motivated by motivated teachers or motivated by the game itself. It's, uh, it's uh, as, as many cases, it's uh, typically the combination of both. It's a motivating way of working and, and a case. And a mystery, uh, mystery science game is, is a quite a motivating game. But it's also it seems that the teachers were quite, uh, quite eager and motivated and adapted it to uh, their, uh, what they wanted to, the students to learn. So the uh, uh, the results they are grouped into type four type of uh, main results. One is the context for learning, and there um, they they think that the study shows strong indications that the fictional elements, the story that they have created, can contribute to academic performance, uh, even though they don't. Uh, have any proof? They didn't do any tests comparing these students with other students. So, so they're just saying that it seems that they are working harder on these matters, and they're seeing from the reports that they are able to understand the topics that they need to learn. And, and uh, I guess also they can see the uh, the way they write reports that's been improved. So, 
introducing a game, a well-designed game with a good story, seems to be a, a capable of contributing that to performance. But they don't say that it will. They just say it didn't get done. But it's important to, to notice that uh, teacher control is important. It can only happen if the teacher is in control. Uh, I don't know. They don't say it can only happen, but it's <laughs> it's likely that the effects are much stronger if the teachers take the whole idea and adapt it to their teaching and, uh, and make sure that it is uh, set in their frame to emphasize what they want the students to learn. Because sometimes the students were di diverging slightly off the topic yes. or, and they had to have the guidance right. from time to so time. There was always one teacher there that would help them, would be kind of a process teacher, a game process teacher, that would help them to go back on track, get back on track, to mm -hmm. make, make sure that they are, are focused. So, but there's also uh, results when it comes to information management skills. Because the, the, uh, when they look at the results, they find that the uh, students' ability to organize information was highly correlated to their success in solving the problem. So those who were good at organizing, structuring, and dealing with information were also the ones that uh, came closest to the, uh, the best solutions. So it, it means that uh, there are strong indications that uh, that a game, well-designed game, would help uh, in, in this type of game, where you have lots of information that might be conflicting, or at least they are uh, are uh, somewhat incomplete and somewhat contradictory. At least it may see contradictory, and they need to, to organize that and, and to conclude, and that would uh, would help them in. Uh, or, or uh, show that the students learn better information management. Um, and uh, this is, I think, what they said was somewhat uh, surprising that uh, the students were much more active than they were thinking. So it became into very much a student driven uh, project. Uh, and one thing that they noted here, and I think that's um, that's a, uh, something to keep in mind, uh, and that is that these features didn't all only give the students immediate feedback on what they did right, but also helped them to see where they had deficiencies in their own skills and help them confront. Say, OK, I know that was too quick a decision. You need to look further. You need to look deeper. You need to do the more of the math before you can get to a, to a better conclusion. So it, it helps them, the students not just to be praised for good work, but also help to see where the weaknesses are. Um, and uh, general problem solving. So this is a mystery game, so they need to solve a problem. And uh, it, uh, it seems that the, um, the students identify themselves more as problem solvers. They're more used to being a problem solver. More than digesting information, they become problem solvers and they seek information that can help them solve a problem. And that seems to be triggered through this uh, process, that they are more actively problem solvers than trying to, to understand what the teachers uh, help. So, um, implications. If you, uh, on one side, look at the role of information and information technology in teaching, uh, it's, um, there are strong indications that information shouldn't just be content given to the students, but it should be resources that produce a context for learning. So all the data that the students had to digest, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't presented that you need to learn this, but they will say that you need to solve this problem. And to solve this problem, then there are some, something you need to know first to be able to solve the problem. So rather than just being content focused, it's more trying to say, OK, now let's create an environment in which the students want to learn. So you can say that the, um, the content is going away from being the center to being more on the periphery, learning. What is in the center is the problem to solve. 
and what you need to, to visit to be that the resources, the information. So what Squire, uh, the way Nico says that, is that it's producing a design experience of moment-to-moment -moment unfolding interaction. So it's more of the learning as the experience, more than what is the actual content that you are able to, to, to grasp and remember. But there's also um, another thing to learn, and that is the importance of the teachers in this picture. So they are, they are saying, based on their study, that uh, the teachers need considerable access to materials to be able to tweak them. So it depends very much on the teachers being able to frame, to set the technology into their, um, what do you say, teaching agenda or their curriculum. So teachers will therefore also not be just consumers of uh, resources. They need to produce and publish information. So that's what they were saying, that, or that's some of the data that they looked at, is what did the teachers produce during this, because they need to look at the, let's say if this was a, an offer to include, include such a game, they will need to go through the game and make their own adaptations and exclude parts and include other parts and, and thereby produce their own version of, uh, of the content. Which means that librarians who are currently keeping records of books and journal papers and whatever, they could also play a more active role in supporting the teachers in uh, adapting the curricula, in helping them to publish or write and publish the material they need to write, and producing knowledge. It's not, not just uh, an uh, archive of information. It's more active role. Okay, so are there any what, what did you read? Were there any you, anything you think I missed in my uh, my walkthrough? You can say loads of things about that paper. So no major points. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, I think it's um, it's good to read these papers once in a while because they disclose more of the details of the design and details of the process. So if you were to run your own study, you can get many ideas from there. So you don't have to start from scratch. Shorter papers that just say, this is setup and these are results, and we'll skip that middle part, it would be much harder to reproduce or to, to, to copy that process. I think from that perspective, I think it's good. So my comments when it comes to the design that they came up with. I think it was a good design. I think it's something that you definitely should, uh, should think of copying. One is, that, uh, as Simon talked about last week, is the alignment of the game and the curriculum. And as I said in the very beginning, the fact that they developed the game with the involvement of teachers, they gave the game away to the teachers, say, okay, now we develop the game. It's your responsibility, it's your work, it's your teaching. So you include it, include it in your teaching. And they were just observing from the outside. It's, um, it's very important that, and that also makes sure that the game is not just a reward for some other activities, as Simon was talking about last week, but that actually a very tight integration between the, um, the game and what you get good at the game and what is important in the courses. And as you mentioned, the involvement of the teachers in the design and in the, uh, the running program. But since, um, as we were saying, this was an uh, exploratory type of work, then the best you could say is these results suggest that. You couldn't conclude anything saying that this is a good way to do things or that is what all the teachers should do. You can't because you don't have that data. What you have is a set of experiments and or, or, or designs and features and you observe and based on the observations you can start formulating hypotheses and these hypotheses can be tested uh, in, in, uh, in uh, other settings. So one of the things uh, is commenting for instance is the fact that their application is more kind of an experimental prototype so it's, it doesn't say with clean word but it's kind of you can read between the lines that it's 
it's a little bit unstable, and and it's uh, they had some technical issues and some other issues, so it's not as polished as the word he's using, as uh, as uh, a final product would be. But then the question is, if the teachers need to adapt, can it be polished? So, so there's that's always a debate. But but anyway, th this is the type of uh, conclusion you can expect from these types of studies. Uh, but there are some um, what I consider to be the weaknesses. I don't know if you have uh, any weaknesses that you look at in the paper. One of the things that I think you should have is, or might have had, is kind of a baseline study. So referring to, so it might be an idea that some of the researchers have spent some time with these teachers in their classes in some similar topics. It might have been the same when they, when they went through the same, um, we're going for the same learning outcome the year before, or, or a different group. At least trying to observe, because we don't know now uh, whether the how different the, the uh, teachers behave, how different the students behave. We don't have that uh, baseline. So I think that would be an uh, advantage if they have that. Um, and they don't say much about what is actually the expected learning outcome. So I'm saying that there's a good alignment, but uh, really I don't know for sure because I don't know. I'm just guessing that it's about science, it's about collaborative work, it's about language, and if that's the case, yeah, absolutely, there's a good alignment. But if they're alignment with something else, then, or if the uh, curriculum was in something else, they might be that to another line. Um, and I think I listed the, the three research questions they had, but they don't discuss and they don't conclude much. So the research questions are posted as kind of, this is what you're going to do, and then they don't discuss it much. I, I think uh, it would be fair to expect that they would come back and revisit the research questions and discuss their, uh, obviously they, they do address the issues, but they aren't very clear on, on trying to answer the research questions. So, so these, I think, are, are parts that could have been uh, could have been. You had other things you think about the strength and the weakness of the paper? It's kind of the same. I think it could have been much more interesting if they had tested the students before and after, for example, tested them mm. and with um, problem solving skills or something, and they could see if there was some difference before and after. Or having so, or maybe a, Or maybe a control group from, that did normal stuff. And, well, I think mm -hmm. that the control Maybe. group, then we are more into experiments. But yes. I think that for for a design method, I think yeah. control group is probably not the way to go. But for it's definitely relevant to try to uh, study the group, mm. how the group is before you introduce something. You look at how they work, and then you introduce, and then you observe the differences. Yeah. So, yeah, which is kind of what they do, even though they, do, uh, they don't have that baseline, uh, mm. as yeah, far so as I can read. Some testing, you would probably get better data to uh, compare to see what improvement. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, uh, if we're going to use the paper, because I mean, now we are getting into tuning you into doing, preparing for your, uh, your own master thesis. I think if you are considering doing a kind of a design method paper, even if it's not uh, in serious games for education, then this is a good piece of work in, in the way they have framed it, in the way they have uh, defined the scope, they design it, involve the users, and let go. Uh, you may not be able one person to do a spot shit mm. in six months, though, but, but in general, <laughs> I think it, there are many, many good things here to uh, learn from. Yeah, one, one other thing which I was missing from the paper was that the kind of game description was a little bit from the uh, high point of view. They haven't discussed in detail how the augmented reality worked, how the placement worked, what how the field mechanics. tricks, what game mechanics they used and so on. And that, that was a little bit um, missing. Like that would add a little bit of weight onto the serious game domain instead of just the educational domain, which I, I would like to have balanced a little bit better. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, one of the papers we, we covered last year, 
was uh, a more unsuccessful paper or, or a paper that wasn't as good. And there's a lot to learn from lots of good papers as well. But I, I skipped them this year in favor of some of the other, the two other papers that, uh, that we are going to be covering. Should we go strictly into the next one, or you want a short break? Just continue. You can continue. Yeah. Okay. Should we check the maybe the questions which student posted for that paper, or should we do yes. it later, at the end? <coughs> um, so I would just need to go because I haven't. I don't have those, actually. I emailed you guys, but I haven't got the copy. Um, okay, so let's, well, let's take them after a break. Let, then, let's, so. let's do that after the break, yeah. Okay, so the next one will be educational games. Yes, the uh, effect. Educational. So that's my point. Okay. Um, it's fine. Yes, we good. Yeah. So this uh, is then, of course, a very different paper because the other one was experimental, trying to observe, and these guys are trying to say, I go through. Um, literature survey and trying to see what is the current research telling us about the effectiveness of educational games. Um, I'll uh, say a little bit about their design and then what they uh, were looking at comparing the type of game or actually the, the, uh, uh, the type of uh, topics or courses they used them in. The uh, type of study programs or studies, uh, preschool, elementary school, secondary school, and then affecting us. And they were actually looking at something that hasn't been so much of a concern, but I was kind of hinting to it in the previous paper, and that is, what is the role of the developer? Is the developer also the one that evaluates the project? And then, if that's the case, which it often is, then you have to be careful mm. not to misinterpret data because you are biased. And then finally, again, a little bit of my own reflections on, uh, on this paper. Um, so this paper was presented at the International Conference of Games and Virtual Worlds for Serious Applications, 2013. So it's, uh, it's rather new. Uh, they were, as I said, trying to study the effectiveness of education games. And the types of studies and the methodological trends there, and especially the bias, saying, right? Did they observe any bias in terms of whether the outcome was the game were reported being positive or negative based on whether developers have been the ones who evaluated the game? Uh, I guess that uh, they don't say, but you would think that the hypothesis is that yes, there's a little bit of bias, and you may be able to see that. That was, I guess, is their hypothesis, even though they don't say that. Um, so, I think this is a good, again, a good demonstration of what a literature review paper should and could look like. So, 
first of all, they describe very well, very detailed, their study, what they do. So in this case, they do cover relevant uh, journal papers published 2002, 2012. Um, and they describe, uh, or they're saying that these were all studies in which the were some uh, empirical evaluation of the learning effect. There were obviously many more studies, but they only worried about them that uh, look specifically at the, uh, the effect. And they are listing the 16 search engines that they used and the search words. And they are saying that they used them in combination. And uh, which I think is a good, um, if you jump off here to a meta discussion, this is something that is, might be a good thing for you to do as well for your, when you start preparing for a master thesis, start to collect, start to set up a list of the search engines that you use and the keywords that constantly give you what you're interested in and run that regularly to make sure that you get updated information. Sorry, that was on the side. <laughs> um, the literature study, if you look at the key numbers, they started with 120 pa uh, papers. They looked at this 10-year period. And they looked at using all these keywords. And there were two researchers. And they split in two. So they collected uh, some uh, papers each. And they ended up with 120 papers. Then they started to compare them. and found that there were some paper duplicates that were indexed by several search engines. So that brought them down to 99. And then they looked specifically at those who had really critical data. And in which the games had been used in a formalized school context, which means that they skipped games for the military, for vocational training, for other educational purposes. They went down to schools, um, only those with really empirical data, and then they had 40 papers. So out of these 120, we had down to 40, which I would think is, uh, is an OK number, but it would be good if it had been 100 rather than 40. Because there are some statistical analysis you might want to do, which is not uh, relevant when you have uh, just 40 papers. Mm. Um, so this is different from the presentation in the paper, because I put all the data in the spreadsheet, and I created charts like that, rather than have this big table. So I'll just go, go through the charts. So types of education games, or what are the subjects, the, the courses that they are used for? And they can report 16 different. So with 40 courses and 16 different uh, subjects, of course, there is much you can do on analysis per topic or per subject or per type, if you want. Um, so you can see here that computer science, geography, language, uh, natural sciences, surgery, they are uh, about 10 plus minus percent each. Math is one third almost, 30 percent related to math. The math, as I was saying, math is a uh, popular <laughs> subject for, for education games. Um, and uh, the paper discusses a little bit why these might be so, uh, so strong. I, I, I don't spend too much time on that. Uh, and then 25 percent are in other. So there are some uh, some other courses that, uh, that are these dominant ones that have one or two, like health and, and some other in general. Now, if you look at the types of studies, uh, there are different methodologies. So experiments, quasi experiments, mixed methods, puzzle studies, and others. Um, you can see that experiment is the most used one. And experiment here means that uh, it's, a, it's a real setup where you have a kind of a random selection of, uh, of uh, users involved. Most experiments are quite similar, but then you are more picking the ones that are involved in the study. Uh, so it's kind of to be expected when you deal with effectiveness. This is what it should be. It should, experiments should be even more. Because that's that's how you can really measure uh, measure the effectiveness. And as you can see, there's no design method here because design methods don't give you much uh, data. They are more observing and trying to indicate what can be proper 
experiment uh, later on. Um, education and context. See, at elementary school is quite popular. It's more than half, 2% of that, are produced in elementary school. And then higher education is the next larger, and secondary school. So preschool and uh, high school are not that dominant. So it's elementary and higher education are too dominant among these, that is. And I guess, um, it, it, I guess it reflects a little bit that higher education, uh, some of the research is done by universities, and the easier thing would be to address what we teach. Mm. And then, of course, elementary school is our, our easier when it comes to subject matter. Mm. So, uh, and, and maybe also more important in, in uh, getting the students' attention, but, but probably has probably to do with it with the subject matter. Mm -hmm. So less likely to try to screw up the experiment. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So, but, but as you can see, there's some room for other types of <laughs> experiments here. So, if you have an idea, there are there is room here in secondary school or high school mm -hmm. for, for for trying some other contexts. And the effectiveness, I divided this way. So, looking at and, and trying to combine the effectiveness and whether the developer was the evaluator or not. So what you see here is that among the 40, you find that 17 studies were set up by independent evaluators. They hadn't developed the game at all. 21 by the developers, which means that if you add these two numbers, you're going to find there are two missing. And that's usually the case that you it's not easy to read from the papers exactly the nature of the, of the study. So, so two papers, they don't know. But for the 38, there are more by the developed by evaluated by developers than the independent. Mm -hmm. Now the interesting is that they aren't very different. Of course, the numbers are small, so so it's uh, one or two uh, uh, in difference would, would create a big difference here, one or two uh, uh, papers. But but what you see is that um, the uh, there are more positive than negative. Definitely, there are very few negative ones. There are a few that I call inconclusive. They may not get inconclusive in terms of being neither negative or nor positive, but in some cases they don't know. It's not easy to read from the paper whether they have a conclusion or not, or the conclusion is neutral. I mixed all that into the inconclusive, so it's neither positive nor negative. Um, and I think it's, um, um, it's interesting that there are negative. But I think it's, it's it, that's the nature of research. We tend to focus on the positive outcome, and if we run a, a project and we don't find, we redo a different project and we try to tune it up because uh, we like to have positive <laughs> effect. Um, and I, I'm also not, not sure uh, something that um, that's uh, Simon I think talked about last week as well is what the positive effect, but it's compared to regular mode of lecturing or, or at all, after it, if they learn something at all, or if they learn more, mm. if they spend two hours here, then two hours going to some other activity. But that's, uh, it's, um, but I think there were, I think, as I was said, I think the hypothesis when I started was that this would be bigger and this would be smaller. Now it seems that the negative is about the same size, so what happens here is that there are more, when the developers do it, they are not so worried about maybe. <laughs> It is more neutral. I think neutral is about the same. So, so it's it's probably more that they are harder to read whether it was positive or not. So maybe they were negative. They just didn't want to tell it. So they were trying to hide it up. So, okay. Um. I think that uh, uh, there are there are a few things to learn. I think from this paper as well. One thing is as they were observing the diversity. Of serious games and serious gaming papers is, is is increasing, which means that if you want to do a literature study, you may want to be rather narrow, because doing a literature study in serious games or in a serious games for education can be quite exhausting. So trying to be more specific, more focused, like they did, they were saying, okay, now we look at effectiveness, not just that, effectiveness in formal school context. So they were quite quite uh, limited in their scope, which uh, you don't have to in a new field, but as the field grows and matures, then you will find 
it branches off in many different subdisciplines. And the report, I think the report is, uh, is quite good and elaborate in terms of going into looking at earlier surveys, summarizing earlier surveys. Uh, they gave a very detailed description of their design, what were the search engines, what were the keywords, how did the process go forward, what were the selection criteria. So it's easy to reproduce. And they show the results in a more raw format. And that's how I can make these charts that they didn't make. I can make them because I have the data. So I can just plot them into my own spreadsheet and, and do my own charts. Mm. So which, which I bring to uh, I think that they could have taken the discussions a bit, uh, a bit further. Uh, I think they were, uh, um, they, stopped a little, they stopped by just saying, these are the characteristics. And, but I think that, as I was saying, I think that part of what you would like to do might require that you have more uh, answers. For instance, there were quite a few math papers, but probably not enough that you can really do, it makes sense to do a, a more detailed anal analysis of math papers. So, so I think some of the discussion issue might have been because they didn't have uh, enough papers to, to make uh, a good discussion and solid discussion. Anyway. I think that was it, wasn't it? Yes, that's it. Anyone reading the paper differently? I mean, something I, I skipped a lot uh, about the, all the previous surveys and, and these things. So I uh, uh, try to focus on their study and because they they might be interesting for you to to also uh, bring with you some of the uh, some of the summaries from the previous studies. Might be interesting and relevant, but I just focused on their. Yeah, you mentioned that they haven't distinguished between the uh, situations where the games were used instead of the normal class, together with the normal class, or instead of anything. Uh, and that is kind of a crucial to yes. measure the effectiveness. And this, this, this kind of distinction, I, I kind of missed that. Exactly. Yeah, I expected that to be present. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought, I thought it would be interesting if they had included um, more info mm. about the people that were tested. For example, if the player types have been taken into consideration, and the people who made the charge of that or that, but if the papers didn't include it. Mm. It could be interesting to see some yep. know, data on that. Absolutely. We, we, we suggested that uh, last year. Uh, to do a study on uh, player types versus uh, styles, and, and uh, do a similar trying to do a similar literature study by looking at uh, education games and player types to see or or, or learning styles or uh, some of these personality. There's a lot of the summaries uh, made me think that uh, the problem. Lots a lot of uh, player types uh, around that. Or may, I don't know if the initial studies actually included it, but uh, some of the summaries hinted that. Mm. Yeah, either player types or the learners types. Either of those would be helpful. Exactly. Yeah. That's interesting. Absolutely. But that's uh, obviously wasn't their scope. <laughs> yeah. Um, should we take a? Ten minutes break? Yes. <coughs> so I will stop the broadcast, but I will reconnect you, Simon, after that. <laughs>